thank you very much to uh, Professor Zofia Jazga for coming up with this risky idea of me representing biological physics and medical physics, especially because uh, my passion is for broad picture. <laughs> Um, so the title of my talk is uh, Structural Entanglements in Proteins and Their Complexes. And uh, uh, this work was done with many people. I would, I would like to show a picture of some of them. So the most... Oh, I'm sorry, something went wrong. Uh, oh, okay. So the whole thing started with Jana Zukowska, my former graduate student. Here she's shown with, uh, when she's getting her L'Oreal Prize, I believe it was in Paris, that was last year. And then it was continued by Mateusz Sikora, from my student, originally from Krakow. But the most recent work and that I want to focus, focus on is by uh, uh, Mateusz Chwastyk, who just got his PhD half a year ago, and now he's a postdoc in Arizona and uh, Arizona State, and uh, my current postdoc, Yanni Jo. Uh, uh, okay. But there are many other people involved, like Gomez Cecilia, uh, Qin Suan Huang, Mark Robbins, Piotr Szymczak, uh, uh, Piotr Sokowski as well, Miodushevsky, uh, who is here, and Mariano Carion Vasquez from Cajali Institute in Madrid. So first, I understand it's a general talk. So what are proteins? Proteins are chains of amino acids. There are 20 types of amino acids. They have very different properties. And some of them like water, some of them do not. And when you place this in water, then often you get a globular structure that, most, that uh, biologists are very familiar with. And that's one example. And this is an atomic representation of this. Uh, however, if you focus on the backbone, then you can isolate easily secondary structures like alpha helices and other things that I won't mention. And this, um, so this backbone twists and turns, however, it doesn't tangle, doesn't make knots, and I want to focus on pro some, usually that is. Uh, but now there's like more than 1,000 structures in which you actually do observe knots, and that's what I would like to discuss later on. However, uh, oftentimes, when you have this chain, it doesn't really fold to this one unique globular structure. Instead, it's a sort of like it forms a thing that goes from one conformation to another, and that is called an intrinsically disordered protein. Uh, that are and the subject of intensive, uh, intense current study. Um, so, uh, but now it turns out that, uh, well, proteins do act as these chains, especially globular proteins are often enzymes. Um, um, but it turns out that most of the time, these proteins, these chains form complexes. And uh, so, for instance, in human. Uh, if you consider human enzymes, then 67% of them are enmeric. That is, you have two chains, you know, they fold, but then they come together and form a complex, okay? And you may even have complexes of out, out, out of 64 chains. Uh, so the question that came to our mind was, can these chains form links? You know, so if links are familiar, you know, you, people know about links, especially mathematicians, like the Hopf links, like two rings, you know, link in this way, or Solomon link, which looks like this, that often you can see in arts. Um, but can protein chains be entangled is the question, you know. Well, there's one difference which is crucial, that is proteins have ends. One end is called N-terminus, and the other one is called C-terminus, -terminal, C so they don't form a closed loop. So the notion of an entanglement in such chains has to be approximate because of the lack of closure. But we still gave it a try, and we consider I mean, there's a depository of protein structure, which is Protein Data Bank, which has nearly 300,000 structures by now, so it's a huge set. And so, but we looked at 10,000 of them, and are chosen arbitrarily. There are some codes associated with this. 
And so we look at some codes, and it turned out that 8.6% of them are entangled. Uh, and how do you tell whether they're entangled or not? Well, if you take two chains and then you try to pull them apart, then do they stay together or do they tangle and don't separate? So that's what they did. It's not quantum entanglement, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, still, it's an entanglement. So, um, uh, so let me, I identified two types of entanglements, type two and type one. And so how do you distinguish them? Well, let's say you have, this is one chain and it goes from terminus N to terminus C. That's shown schematically in blue. And there's another one between N prime and C prime, okay? And then let's say you anchor N and C. Keep, and then you pull by N prime and C prime. Then, and I'll tell you later how we pull, but uh, basically when you do that, so in this way, then it turns out that, that if, you, if you keep it anchored, then, it's, then you just cannot separate them. They, they, they are linked together for good, okay? Now, if you do the opposite, that is, you anchor n prime and c prime, then you get the same thing. No, again, you cannot separate. And if this is happens, then we call it type two entanglement. And two, well, because it's less common than type one, and in type one is that if you do it one way, it separates, but if you do it the other way, it does not. Okay, so it's not, um, and actually most of them of type one, um, it's still, okay, so this is a lobster and a laugh, that's kind of an entanglement, you see, of type two, and type two forms 15% of the cases that we started, but this whole thing is related to the linkage number, which tells you if you have one curve and another, then how many, then how many, what is the number of times that one curve winds around the other? And that you would be calculated mathematically that's by doing this Gauss's uh, uh, integral. However, it's well defined for closed loops which we do not have. So we have to close it arbitrarily, and if you close it one way, and if you connect, and we see, say, under this protein this way or this way, then we get different linking number, the two or one. Here it means that you'd make two turns, that one chain makes two turns around the other, and in this case, if you close it this way, then you make just one turn. But still, either way, well, with these problems of mathematics, Still, in this case, you cannot separate the, chain, the two chains and you call it entangled. Now, if you take the type one, then in one case you get, say, linking number of one, and in the other case you get linking number, number of zero, so it's, you get different outcomes depending on what you do. Uh, so, mm, so, but now, uh, this is a picture done by a nine-year-old, <laughs> which I like. But I am interested in entanglements now arising in single chains, not in two chains. Now, if you will, in topological features occurring in single chains. And um, you can do it, uh, well, the one way that we actually came up with uh, first, some 10 years ago, uh, is that um, the object in uh, biology, which are called cysteine knots. These are not really knots in mathematical sense, but it works like this. That let's say you have, uh, this is just one single chain, okay? And, uh, but uh, it has a certain covalent, I mean, backbone is made of covalent bonds called peptide bonds, okay? But in this, there are certain proteins which are, have additional covalent bonds, which are called disulfide bonds or cysteine bonds. Okay, between which connect two atoms of sulfur in cysteine, uh, cysteine. Okay, and so you see, if you have a backbone like this, and if you connect this by that, then you form a ring. Okay, there's a ring in this structure. But now there's a third bond that um, connects the upper part of the backbone with the uh, part which is underneath the ring. And, uh, and the whole structure looks like a little capsule, and that's called cysteine knots by biologists, okay? But the, our discovery was that when you start pulling that, that, I'll tell you how we do it in real life in a minute, 
then uh, you can, you can, when you try to pull this of the piece of the backbone through this ring, and gener that generates huge forces, and you generate a slip knot. Slip knot is something like this, and uh, and dragging it through this can we claim gener can make generate forces of 1,500 piconewtons, uh, which is a big number. I'll show you I what to compare it to on the next page. Uh, but we still need for experimental verification. There's a related structure called lasso, pierced lasso, um, um, then in which you have um, a ring is formed by these disulfide bonds, and then the remaining part of the backbone is either like, you know, attached like this, or it may go through with me, you know, it may go through the ring. Uh, and there's big interest in that because one protein. Uh, what is it called? Leptin, I think, <laughs> which is responsible for control of obesity is of this kind. Uh, so now, what, how, what do you do, how do you stretch it experimentally? Well, there is a thing called atomic force microscope, and in the biological context it was actually, I believe, developed in Ludwig Maximilian's <coughs> University in Hermann Gaub's lab in Munich. And so you anchor one end of a chain of proteins and you attach it to cantilever of the AFM and you pull and the workhorse of the studies was titan, which is a muscle protein, and the typical for the, 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 the characteristic force, which we denote by F max, which uh, ba basically describes the mechanic stability of the protein and for titan, which is 200 piconewtons. Okay? Whereas, uh, well, there are some studies of spider capsules, uh, I mean, various pieces of the silk, of spider silk, and the largest number I've seen was 800 or 900, but generally, you know, if you have 400, that's a huge number in the world of proteins. And usually, this is related to shear. You know, if you start pulling, say, titan, then you pull this to the right, you pull this to the left, and there are bonds called hydrogen bonds between this strand, piece of the strand and that. When you start pulling, you generate shear. And if you rupture many bonds together, then you, like in Titan, like six, seven hydrogen bonds, then this is when you get like 200 piconewtons. Whereas if you take DNA and pull by the whiskers, you know, the double helix, then you get forces only of 15 piconewtons because it's not shearing, it's rupturing one bond at a time. So you get much smaller forces. But in this uh, 16 knots, uh, what you do is there's a very different mechanism. It's not shear, it's sort of uh, working against, against the static constraints. Uh, so maybe let me skip that. Uh, but now there's another category of topological effects, knots. Not 16 knots, but by knots, but knots without any extra covalent bonds. And again, there's a... Mm, uh, an approximation here, that, this is an example of uh, one, the simplest knot denoted by 3-1, which is called trefoil. Uh, that's mathematics, but in proteins, there's no, there's no closed line. Okay, so it's cut, that's why I denoted it by that. And uh, so, and right, right now we know there's at least 1,000 protein structures in this PDB. And there's a database created by Zukowska and her people at Sent now. Uh, which lists them all and the properties. Mm, and there is a big debate on what is the role of the nodes, and, uh, but that involves biology, so I don't want to discuss it now. Uh, but uh, one obvious thing is that may enhance stability of the proteins. But if I, time permits, I want to argue that it may be related um, to some neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, so, uh, first of all, you, well, how do you know if you have a knot? Well, at least one algorithm that was proposed, but it's not perfect. It may miss knots, but if it finds it one, it's fine. And uh, that's called um, KMT algorithm after these names. And so basically, when you have a structure which often is huge and it's hard to know what is what. That's why the first knot was discovered for really in 1994, was proposed that maybe you have knots even though the structures existed before, but you have to look at it to see if they were not. Uh, so basically, you want to reduce the structure to something simpler. So you do it in steps. So you consider three points. 
uh, in the backbone. And uh, then you see, want to see if, if this thing goes through, if, it, if the, uh, there is no other piece of the backbone which goes through this triangle, then you can get rid of this point and just replace it by a single bond. But if there is something that goes through, you cannot do that, okay? So if you keep repeating it, then, some, then you, get, you, you, you can reduce the whole thing to something like that, and you say, okay, you have a threefold, uh, or threefold, it's pronounced this way as well, uh, structure, uh, not uh, in this object. Now, uh, now you can distinguish between deep nodes and shallow nodes. And to, so if you, uh, you may ask what are the node ends. So if you keep repeat, you can, uh, you, you find that there is a um, knot somewhere, okay? But then you cut out uh, one bond at the end, here and there, okay? And at some point, uh, you know, if you keep cutting, the knot will disappear, okay? So the last stage is the one which defines the knot ends, okay? So the knot, oh, I'm sorry. So the knot ends are, you know, if they are far away from the terminal points, like in this case, this is one, um, this is this methyl transferase uh, with its name, and the structure code is this one, it's a deep node. It's an example of a trefoil node, it's, these ends are far away. But if you take this hydrolase, then it turns out that at least one end is very close to the terminus, and that's very easy to, you know, untie or tie and so on, because the tail can wiggle. The question is, you know, how to fold to a structure which has a deep node is highly non-trivial. Uh, so, in much of this um, study was done theoretically using a coarse grain model in which you represent amino acids by beads, uh, which are separated by the length of the peptide bond, roughly. But then, this is not a protein yet. You need to assign certain attractive contacts to it so that it falls to a globular structure if it is a globular structure. We also work on how to make such a model for disordered proteins. So, uh, so if you do have a native structure, then you can uh, read it in and uh, assign Van der Waals uh, volumes enlarged by a factor to individual amino to atoms that form amino acids, like in this code. And then if you see that this enlarged volumes overlap, then you say, okay, there's an interaction between the two, which we call a contact. Okay, it's electrostatic microscopically, but, uh, but we represent it effectively by some uh, potential with a well. The simplest example is Leonard Jones potential. And it turns out that the depth of the well, if you calibrate it to the experimental data on stretching, is of order of 1.6 kilocalories per mole, or 0.07 electron volts, if you want this unit, or 0.35 kVT. So room temperature in this unit, is, if you take uniform epsilon, then it's like 0.35. Now, we, we used models with non-uniform epsilon, but it turns out that the simplest works the best when this epsilon is uniform. Whereas this length parameters just uh, are calculated based on the N, uh, C alpha, C alpha, that is the main atom in each amino acid, in the, as you have it in the structure, in the PDB file. And we include water by introducing uh, thermal Langevin noise, you know, and uh, that's how we control temperature. Uh, so this is representing amino acid by a cluster of grapes. That's, this corresponds to that. If the grapes overlap, we have a contact. No, and we made a survey of nearly 20,000 proteins, and that's how we discovered the cysteine nodes and all the noted structures, actually. And we have a database in which you can look at it. Now, the, I mean, what we're interested in is dynamics of proteins with nodes. So you can unfold by heating, you can unfold, unfold by stretching, or mechanical manipulation, and you can unfold chemically. Uh, but then you, in another la, uh, con, uh, transformation in, which involves large conformational transitions is folding. And the question is how do you fold from here to there? Especially if you want to have a structure which has a deep knot. Now, uh, this is uh, difficult to monitor experimentally. That's why you have to rely on... Uh, on uh, um, modeling, however, there's a direct method of telling whether you have a knot or not. 
and that is stretching actually. So if you have a, you know, if you have a protein that is not, you keep stretching, and that how it was done in, uh, what is that, in Reef, you know, by Reef in Munich, is that you have a protein that, that you know, if, you, if there's no knot, then you can stretch it fully, okay? But if there is a knot, then you cannot stretch it to the full, you know, length of the peptide bonds because some of the distance is covered by the knot. So that's how you tell it experimentally. Uh, now, if you heat a protein with knot, then you see this is something like that. Schematically, it corresponds to this. This, is, this end goes through this loop. But if you heat it up, it will get out and, you know, you can do it like that. But, but now the issue is how do you reverse it? So if you start with this, uh, uh, so either you can fold it back, you know, either for fully unfolded structures with no contact and so on, you can do it with slightly prepared structure that if you just heat it up a bit, it still has some topology, you know, and then fold it back. Um, so that was how it was done by Sukowska, Sukowski and Onuchik when she was a postdoc at University of California, San Diego. And they found that this is a rare folding, it's a rare event. They found that you get one to two percent success rate, but they didn't say it was temperature, whereas I believe temperature is a crucial factor in the way you do, do, way you do that. But they suggested that the folding takes place by forming a slip knot first, and then it goes farther. Now, when we tried to repeat it, then we had no, it's found it very difficult. There are so many ways to fold it to. And um, so we had zero success rate at whatever temperature, um, even though we had 1,200 trajectories and so on. But we were, start, we were starting from extended no, unprepared conformations. But if you prepare it with this thermal heating and then folding back, that you can get this like 1.2%. But still, what it is important here is that this is a very difficult process. You know, it's not clear how, how that proceeds. However, if you take a shallow knot, then it's much easier and maybe this still, it's not much time, so maybe I'll skip the discussion of that but basically, there are various pathways in which you can fold. There is something called direct threading. Mm, this is direct threading. This end goes through the loop. We can form slip knot. This is slip knot, the bend in the line, and this bend goes through the loop, and then it goes through. And this is mouse trapping, which is like the real direct thre thre threading, except that it's the loop that goes onto the terminus and not the other way around. And so we started it in our model, you know, with huge statistics, and we came up with other mechanisms, and, and so, but let me skip it. But the important thing is that, that if you do that, then you have, this is the optimal folding time, what is the time needed to do this as a function of temperature. And uh, this is the success rate in achieving this knotted structure in this case of the shallow knot, and it can reach up to 72%. You can also misfold, that is, you can get structures without any knots. But now, the question, but let's go back to the issue of the deep knot. You know, how come, it, how, why, why is it form? I mean, it's one or two percent success rate, even if true, it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. But then we thought that, okay, but maybe these knots are formed during the production ribosomes. So there are, there are organelles or complexes, which are called ribosomes, in which messenger RNA comes in, and then it's a complicated thing that got Nobel Prize for, um, and then it's a production that you, a protein emerges from here, you know, goes out here, this is, you can think of it as a plane, um, and the end, end first, okay? So, so we thought, so maybe let's try to model it, uh, this ribosomal action, and see whether we get a bit of lag folding to a knotted structure. And in fact, we do. And, uh, but we, get a, we do a full modeling. Uh, mm. Okay, now I wanted to show a movie, but since I have seven <laughs> minutes left, but basically the movie is 
a picture from the ballet called uh, Vajader, in which the most famous piece is that the dancers come one at a time. You know, there's first one dancer who comes, then the second, then the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. So that's like making uh, and this music to it. And, um, and so that is how we envision making this. So, so basically what we did is that we had a plane. We think of it like growing a plant from a ground. Okay, so you generate the amino acids from this. This is 15 residues are formed and 95 and so on. And it turns out that if you do it, and at some point when the protein is fully formed, then it detaches. And basically what's happening, there's some loop forming and there's some piece. Um, um, so, so this, in the, what is in the red is the loop. Um, whereas this thing, this in purple, when it will be detached, would form a slip knot which will go through the loop. Okay. So basically what happens is that at some stage, you know, forms a loop like this, and when it is that it would go through and would fall. Okay. So, so we think that if you do this, then, okay, but that also is controlled by the temperature. And in our simple model, we get within room temperature in this area, we get, I mean, zero success if it is too low, zero success if it's too high, but around the room temperature, you get like probability of 3%. Um, uh, but then it turns out, you know, I gave you a description of, of context. Which, this is an approximate uh, method to determine what is the context. But if you augment it with other procedure to determine what is the context, uh, which I don't want to go into, that we can boost, which you add several more contacts, we can boost it to 6%. So the suggestion is that if you have deep nodes, then the action of the ribosome may actually help to form it. Whereas, if you have a um, uh, shallow knot, then it's not essential to have ribosome. It does, it does boost the product, success rate from 72% to 83%, but it's not essential for it to form. Uh, so now, um, let, this is a circle of life, so we discuss production of proteins, but now there's a degradation. So proteins, when they are not needed anymore, have to be degraded. And that's done by complexes called unfoldases, and it has various names in various organisms, and this degradation can be selective or non-selective. Um, so I'm interested in selective degradation. So in bacteria, these uh, unfoldases are called CLP or LON, and eukaryotes, it's called, they are called proteasomes, and there's one common structure which has a symbol, 26 S for it. So I call, I call it generically a proteasome. Okay? So this is an example of a proteasome, and it has uh, two parts. It's a, red, regular, a regulatory particle and a core particle. In the core particle, you have digestion or, de, or degradation, that is cutting of the chain into individual amino acids so that they can be reused. Okay, but then there is this thing which is called a regulatory particle, which draws the protein to be degraded in. It pulls it in. Okay, and it's ATP controlled and so on. But I don't have time to explain all this. Uh, but uh, but this was studied, for instance, at Berkeley. So you have a variant of the AFM apparatus in which you have you can study. Um, you know, so if you have a proteasome, actually the bacterial one in this case, and you have some protein, green flu fluorescent protein here, and then, um, and then you can, it's pulled by the proteasome in to be degraded, but then there's another polystyrene particle which, uh, which tries to hold it back. So you can, it's, if you keep pulling this to the right, that you can measure the stalling force. Right. At, what, at some point, you can prevent this protein from going into. Okay? And they measured some um, stalling force for the 20 piconewtons. And the, you, as a byproduct, you can also measure what, what is the speed of degradation. It is of order of 80 residues per second. Now, uh, so 
this is a complicated and huge object, so all atom simulations seem hopeless in this context. So what we did is that we did a coarse grain model of this um, proteasome, and the model consists of a cylinder which mimics the core particle, and torus which represents the entry point, entry part of that, and we have some potentials associated with it. So and the geometry is taken from the real structures. And uh, that's how it looks. So basically, so basically, the model is geometry, a funnel made of a cylinder and a torus, and there's a pulling force which mimics this dragging in related to degradation. So degradation is a chemical, chemical thing. We cannot model it in a coarse grained model like ours. So this is how it works, and this is how it was measured in Berkeley. You can do it at constant speed of force, but it looks that physiologically, constant uh, force is the mode, uh, or perhaps intermittent force, constant force. Um, and, it, and it turns out that if you, um, if you start, if you, this is, uh, if you apply a force, pulling force, and this is the time needed to unfold it fully, okay? So that depends on the force. If you have, this, this has nothing to do with knots yet. I mean, it's a regular protein. Okay? So if you apply a big, big force, it would unfold rapidly, so it's show time. But uh, these are not physiological forces. These are much smaller. Okay? So, so the time scale would grow, so that it would show. So it, that it's in the proteasome. And this is the curve in the absence of proteasome. What would be the corresponding effect of the similar force when you have no proteasome? So you see, generally, if you have this thing, then you, the time scales are much shorter. So proteasome facilitates unfolding. Uh, because certain shearing becomes unzipping, you know, separate the two parts, and it's harder to... Ref no, if you fold protein, uh, unfold proteins and... Uh, without proteasome, it default, and uh, you know, whereas this is prevented in the proteasomes, it's much faster. But now, um, uh, why we're interested in knotted proteins. So let's say that you have a knotted structure. What would happen then? And uh, so it turns out that it's much harder because this knot, knot may jam proteasome. The thing may get stuck. So we'll lay, you wait for a long, long time, and nothing happens. This is the end-to-end -end distance. And uh, so nothing happens for millions of our units, uh, where tau incidentally is of order nanosecond. And, um, and what sometimes they would be jumped, but it never unfold fully, okay, because of this. These are proteins with knots. Uh, now, why is it relevant uh, in the context of neurodegeneracy? Perhaps or we think it's uh, relevant. Well, it turns out uh, that. Um, uh, so there are many, many neurodegenerative diseases. One of them is called Huntington, and um, and, and it, it has um, protein involved, huge protein of 3,000 residues, and a part of it. Uh, and uh, but it has a segment called exon one, which has a, what is known as poly-Q tract. That is a chain of polyglutamines, identical. Uh, residues, uh, identical amino acids. And uh, they may have a helix on one end in real, real life and some turn on the other end. And now, this kind of thing depend, is known experimentally to, uh, to generate, uh, to be responsible for at least nine diseases. And this depends on the length of, of this tract, how we know. Basically, what happens is that uh, mm, that in the humans, the length of that polycule tract is for the 16, 20 residues, and then we're healthy. But if it is something like 35 or more, then there's a biological or medical experimental evidence that it becomes toxic. So it's not clear why. Of course, typically in neurodegeneracy, toxicity is related to formation of fibers, oligomers, and such. But there's evidence that this toxicity in this case also exists on a monomeric level. Okay. So basically, we, what we did was that we studied this polycule chain by all atom simulations, and we asked what are the independent structures. And it turns out that it was a huge job 
done in collaboration with Spain. And that, so we have 246 structure independent conformers in the simulation, and it turned out that 9.3% of them are knotted. And there could be shallow nodes, deep nodes, uh, and so on. Whereas if you do a similar job that was for polyvalent that was done in Italy by Laio in his group, then this is like 3%. Okay? So it looks uh, like you can have knots in this disordered segment of the, uh, incidentally, this polycule is disordered, I forgot to say that. But it, so it forms various conformations, and some of them may be long lasting, like 100 nanoseconds. Okay? So then you ask, what is the role of this knotted conformation? And our simulations show, uh, so these are examples of what we get. Uh, so basically, what has, if you separate knotted conformations from unknotted, and ask what is the translocation time through this, this funnel of ours, then the knotted structures take long, much longer on average, that's st big statistics. Where if you ask a probability to stall that it gets stuck, it doesn't go through, then also if you have knotted, for knotted it's, you know, it's substantially higher than for unknotted structures. So, so in other words, this is the summary, so don't worry, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so we did various techniques, mostly coarse grain modeling, uh, to study proteins with knots and also disordered uh, protein chains with knots. And, um, and when, uh, when this discussing generation of these proteins, and we find that the ribosomes may help uh, proteins to form a knot, especially deep knots. Okay, so, that, so they are formed, you know, they are born this way with the knot. And then they can combine to form dimers or what, and whatever uh, other mechanisms. Okay. And, uh, but the, uh, it's important, you cannot just say the success is something, the success in doing that depends on the temperature, of course, depends on the model and so on. And we have also studied an, an, um, Another thing that I didn't uh, mention, but we also studied proteins and at air-water interfaces, which are of importance in food industry, or if you want to come to Wrocław and want to drink beer, and if you want foamy beer, then there are two kinds of proteins which are responsible for the stability of the foam. And uh, what is the mechanism for that? Well, the pro these proteins are the interface, the bubbles in the interface between air and water, and uh, so that's why we're interested in that. Uh, beer is interesting. So, uh, and, but as a byproduct, because of our interest in knots, we also studied proteins which have shallow knots, and we find that if you have interface which exerts hydrophob hydrophobic forces, you know, act, you know uh, proteins which are hydrophilic would like to be on this water side, and hydrophobic would like to be on the air side, then that may form a node or unfold a node, if it is shallow. Okay, so this kind of interfaces may induce random you know, topological <coughs> transformations. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much.